be uh, difficult. I, I think... Uh, no, Matthew, you didn't make me wait. Arguing about Philip Vian and putting my dog in the garden made me wait. I do apologise for that. He needs to go to the loo. So, today we are talking about the C-Class. Now, the thing is, 28 ships were ordered in World War One, And... <laughs> yes, he was the best admiral ever. Um, 28 ships were ordered in World War One, And they were frankly weird as anything. Okay, so... Let's start off with the um, start from the basics with the C class. They were all ordered as light armoured cruisers. Not light cruisers, light armoured cruisers. No, no one really understands that phrasing at all. We'll just put it down to a legacy of Admiral Fisher and leave it there. The idea were these ships would somehow have enough firepower to support the destroyers uh, if they were doing attack and could do scouting and all these things. But then they go and put their two six-inch guns on their stern. So they're basically, they're ar armoring, arming them so that they can always fight best when they're running away. And they have four inches and all sorts of things around them. But eventually the class comes good. The first 14 ships we can ignore by the time it gets to the interwar period. They go through World War One. some of them actually into service during World War One, but it's the cruisers are kind of like destroyers in World War Two. They are being ordered because they need them. They're the general purpose things which are going to fill in all the holes that are missing because you don't have enough battleships, you don't have enough cruisers. By the time you get to World War Two, the cruisers are the capital ships. And destroyers are filling these things. But the C-Class are still there. The C-Class have a role. The C-Class are adapted to being anti-aircraft cruisers. And what they do is they adapt 13. The 13 remaining vessels all get adapted in various shapes and forms to being anti-aircraft cruisers. And they have a really important role. Because you have to remember the Royal Navy bases its air defence around target identification around accurately spotting an enemy and trying to kill them. Now, pre-radar, this is all based on the Mark I eyeballs. And that is critical. That is often very, very critical. But there are ways the Royal Navy gets around that. But also there's the fact the Royal Navy is always planning for radar to come in. And when I say is always planning, I mean they have an idea that radar's coming about. They don't know how well it's progressing because the Air Ministry information supply is difficult and convoluted at best because the Air Ministry are very worried about information getting out anywhere. So they're being very, very protective over this information. They're not wanting to share it with anyone because they don't want to risk it being given away to somebody else one. And this means the Navy is getting very, very little data, getting enough to know it's coming, but not enough to know when. And their first idea is that there's going to be a few ships with it. Tribal class and the C-class cruisers and other cruisers. Well, the C-class are what are done. And basically, it's three classes. The three subclasses which survive are the Caledonians, the Ceres, and the Carlisles. Now, I've been asked specifically about Kuraka or Coca Boat. So I'm going to do a little bit about her because she's one of my favourites. And also, she has one of the saddest ends. Um, she gets sunk, quite cruelly, uh, by HMS Queen, uh, by RMS Queen Mary. I'll call her HMS, but it's RMS Queen Mary off uh, Normand. Um, basically, what happens is that she's escorting Queen Mary in her role as troop ship. And they are both zigzagging. And one zigs when the other one zags because they're out of time. And the Commodore aboard the Queen Mary goes, they know, will know what to do. And they'll get out the way. And the Royal Navy cruiser thinks that the cat thinks the same thing about 
the great big cruise line and the great big liner which is coming towards it that they will get out of the way because you know they're both sort of zigzagging and to try and keep up because by this point this is a light armored cruiser which is 20 years old is trying her best to keep up is sort of cutting off the zigzag a little bit she thought they'd give her a bit of room a bit away they didn't in the fact they sliced through her and so she gets sunk and actually what interests me about this class is five out of the 13 that survived World War Two do get sunk, including Cairo, Matthew. I know you think Cairo is amazing. HMS Cairo gets sunk in 1942. Now, the conversion is what always interested me because it's the debate over what the Navy is short of in terms of firepower. Um, some ships get a heavy armament of 4.5 inch, 4.7 inch, 4 inch, depending on what's going on. Um, I just remember that actually it's the D class which get the 4.7 inch. They, uh, the, the C classes get mostly the 4 inch. They also get 40 millimeter Bofors and they get 20 millimeter Orlicans and they get a festooned with weaponry because they have to be. The Royal Navy isn't short of anti-aircraft firepower in comparison to other navies. It is short of anti-aircraft firepower in comparison to what it needs to fight a war. So, I hope that makes sense. And the other thing I'm going to clear up here before I even get on to the 22nd of April, which will be coming up at some point, is that Navies have different approaches to air defences and concepts of operations. And this doesn't necessarily make one right or wrong. They will design it to fit their own suite, their own operations. If you're just fighting in the Pacific, or that is where you think you're going to be fighting, you can afford to design your fleet around fighting in the Pacific. If you're going to think you're going to fight across the world, you have to prepare to fight across the world. And you have to work out how you're going to sustain that fight. And that can make a lot of changes to information. Now, what was the, which was the best armament? Uh, well, the best armament will... It's the 40mm Bofors, let's be honest. That was the best AA weapon in World War II, by a long, long shot. Um, but no, uh, the 4-inch guns were very, very useful. They provided a lot of suppressive fire for air defence, especially once they managed to get them radar lined up and managed to get them well-armed, well-aimed. The 20mm Oroclons were great at making sure the enemy, if they got close, got fragged. But the 40mm were the ones which provided the most useful firepower. Now, one of the phrases I use is there's no point having a, a gun with infinite range if you can only see 10 metres. You know, it's a phrase I use a lot when teaching. The 40mm Bofors, the reason that was so good in World War II was because that was the sweet spot at range for radar, for eyesight, for all the systems which were a, available to provide information to guns for targeting, to provide that information so the gun could actually be on target and could blast the living hell out of it. And they did. Sorry, uh, YouTube, that was a bit which probably went past PG-13. Now, when I was looking at the C-Class, I had a lot of fun, and I will state, I've got a pile of books here, a pile of books down here, and there's some sheets I printed out, and stuff there, just depending on which questions come up. As you're being quiet on the questions so far, I'm going to dive into this one, which I'm saving as a backup, which is, of course, Malcolm Wright's excellent camouflage book. Now, I will admit... I got sent this copy because I reviewed it for a journal, so I got it for free. I love getting books for free because, as you can all see, I have a serious addiction. It's a problem. It keeps me from indulging in any other addiction. But, you know, it works. Now, would a ship with lots of 40mm at expense of 4.7 or 4 inch be worthwhile? Ask the battle class, battle class destroyers. They have 4.5 inches forward, and the rest of the ship is covered by 40 millimeters. So, 
you can say, yes, there was one and there was a design which was data produced on that, along that principle. I would say they would prefer not to. The Royal Navy went back quite quickly with the Daring class and with any other classes with having a more balanced firepower layout. And honestly, the reason they have the 4.5 inches forward only in about class is because the turret they have for them is so expensive, so invasive, so complex. It's actually a capital ship turret, uh, an aircraft carrier turret, which has been repurposed for a destroyer that they can only, there's a limit to the availability and the speed at which they can produce them. So they're going with two because that's the best option. Now, can I find the C-Class cruisers? Yes, I can. <laughs> Straight into them. Caledon Kuroko. So, Kuroka, or Kokobo, is this one on the bottom. Now, she only has two war color schemes which is rather a disappointment for her. She goes from there, which is gray, to this, which is a greenish gray, and then back to gray. She never really gets to have the jazzy colors which other navy, which other ships get. You know, if we consider HMS Coventry here, goes through a full set of jazzy colors, like many of them did. And the reason they have the jazzy colours is to try and confuse not just U-boats, but planes, anyone looking at them and having to look rapidly as to where they're going, what they're doing. You know, the idea is that you can make a... Like with the modern um, system which is being used to make pictures look like the ships are moving and the waves are moving. Um, I forget what it's called. It, they, these sort of ideas were to make the ships look like they were going in different directions. You did a camouflage painting. And, right, so, now to get into more detail about the ships. Well, I found this lovely plan of HMS Coventry. And the reason I'm using Coventry is because despite the fact she isn't Kuraka, which is the main focus of today, she is of the same class. So she gives you a good example of how she was laid out. Now, as you can see, originally, six inch guns. Again, why? Why? As you can see, what they do with uh, with Coventry here, oh, she's armed slightly differently to Kurokawa on a conversion. She's got lots of these single four inch high angle guns. She's got a pom pom mount on the front. And she's got 40 millimeters on the back. So she's got a lot of stuff in her. Now, during the Norway campaign, my grandfather described being bombed and trapped in a companionway. What was, was the extent of damage? There was a lot of damage uh, in Norway. Remember, the AA cruisers were something which actually the German doctrine often attacked and focused on. So these ships were quite powerful in blasting back. Um, originally, the, uh, the, there seems to have been a perception somehow in some of the reports I read that the AA cruisers are somehow singled out because of their firing back at the Germans. Actually, I think it's because the Germans think that the British are operating by visual pickets and the AA cruisers are often out with the destroyers at the visual pickets. Sometimes they are back with the convoys and they're back with the forces moving around, but they can also equally be forward with the destroyers or hanging back with the destroyers to try and form a barrage. Remember, the British in Norway are still trying to develop their anti-aircraft technique. They're not quite sure how to do it. There is the famous incident where HMS Gurkha actually charges an air attack. Now, you can say she's successful because the air attack doesn't get through and doesn't attack the convoy. You can also say there's a small problem because she managed to get sunk in the process. But, you know, you take a win. And besides, it's a tribal class destroyer called HMS Gurkha. And the enemy were nearby. Did anyone really expect it not to charge? Come on. You have a force of ships selected for their aggression, uh, crews selected for their aggressive nature, uh, officers selected for aggressive nature. Given the name HMS Gurkha, it's going to fight. What's interesting to me, and especially when going through these, and... Um, this is Kurakar. 
Now, as you can see, she's slightly differently armed to Coventry. In that she's got double four inches in three positions. She has got three high angle four inches, a double four inches map. That's because she actually serves as the template for what they do with the Carlisle class, which is a better picture of it. The reason they do this is because Kurokar is actually one of the better preserved ships of the C class. So they can afford to muck around with her more than they can with some of her elder sisters. Now, she also did get damaged a bit in Norway, which allowed them to muck around with her more. But she was still a fairly successful ship and she was doing quite nicely. Now, when I talk about cruisers and World War II, people usually start to talk to me about the county class and or the town class and talking about 10,000 tons and these sort of things. The C class are about 4,000 to 5,000 tons, depending upon uh, the modifications that have happened to them and whether they're fully loaded or not. That's quite a lot, but it isn't massive for a cruiser. Honestly, if we think about modern ships, well, that's a lot less than the daring class destroys the current ones were displace. Um, in fact, let me just check. I should remember this from memory because my dad built them, which is why the pictures of HMS Montrose are on the wall behind me. Um, but I couldn't, and my dad is no longer with us, so that's good. That's, um, means he won't know. I forgot it. They are actually about the same weight as a Type 23 class frigate. And they're good. Was there any reason the, why the uh, ships of the subclasses prior to Caledon were scrapped in 930s rather than more conversions? Yes, they were terrible. They were literally terrible. It took them about 14 ships to get into these in the building. No. Um, the what the Royal Navy found was those first classes were very difficult to upgrade the engines of. Hello, uh, hello, the Liga, and for the Type Forty Five, seven thousand two hundred tons. I yeah, I know they're less than a Type Forty Five, but they're about the same weight as a Type Twenty Three. The earlier ones they had problems with upgrading the engines. They couldn't refit the engines. They couldn't do a lot of things, and they most importantly they didn't have the ability in space to really reconfigure internally. Remember, again, the light armoured cruiser designation basically mucked them up. And by about the 1930s, the Royal Navy is calling them light cruisers. But even then, the Royal Navy is not keen on calling them light cruisers. Because that means people start counting them against their 70 cruisers. And they're going to anyway because they fit in that particular portion. But really, the Royal Navy is not looking at these ships and going, that's a cruiser. No. The C-Class are not cruisers the Royal Navy wants in combat. As cruisers. In about 1938, the very good gentleman known as Admiral Henderson, Third Sea Lord, goes, uh, you know, we have these ships you guys keep complaining to me about and wanting replacements for, but we can't replace them yet. Yes, goes several Third Sea Lords. Uh, <clears throat> he tried this on the one prize at Chatfield. It didn't quite work. So when he tried it on Chatfield, Chatfield went, yes. Probably slightly looking over his shoulder going, he's got me alone in the room. No, no. Well, I have a plan. He did have a plan. And it was he who started the conversions. He started the conversions slowly with the Caledonians, right? He starts off with them because... Hi, Ian. He starts off with them because... There's only three of them left, and if he mucks it up too much, no one will notice. And so they start an extensive refit. Then they go on to the series class, and they start a refit of them. <laughs> yes, Will. Uh, I'm not sure. Me and the class are pretty good looking ships. Anyway, back to the C class. The series were. The ones which, of course, Kurokawa, but actually the ones least modified. 
And then you have the Carlisle class. And frankly, the Royal Navy goes to town on those ships. Um, let's consider this. So, they start out looking like this. World War I cruiser. It's very, very bare bones superstructure wise. It's very limited. And please do take a note of the funnels. Take a note of the funnels. Notes that they go from three down to two. The earlier ones mostly have three funnels and they have more complicated or engine arrangements. And this is a factor into why they basically get got rid of. So these are the two tunnel ships. Two funnel ships. And then look at what comes about. That's a far more substantial superstructure. That's far more space because they need to be to support what they're putting into them. And why do you have anti-aircraft crews? Why do you need them? Well, you need them for the air defence of the forces, but also, most importantly, the Royal Navy's worked out they need something to protect aircraft carriers. Yeah. It's no surprise that the Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, or the guy who'd been the first Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers, he becomes Third Sea Lord, and he goes, well, you know what? We have two problems in exercises. One, our aircraft carriers, if they get attacked by aircraft, we are in trouble because we need the strike to go off. And two, well, we've got nothing. If we are having to keep put our modern units next to them to protect them, what are we going to use those modern units for? And the perfect thing was to take a C-class cruiser, which they didn't really want as a cruiser, turn it into a floating great big AA barrage, stick it next to a carrier and go, hello. Dido class were never enough and were not going to be built fast enough. And yes, the sea class were definitely a bit North Sea. They were pretty much... Well, let's put it this way. Uh, they were North Sea and maybe Denmark Straits obsession rather than the global operation. Dido class never coming in fast enough. And you have to remember the Royal Navy was also getting to the point, even by about 1942 in World War II, where they were seriously worried about the Dido class's longevity. There is a reason that you would expect in wartime, if the light cruiser is so useful, that with limited shipyard space and limited capacity, you would have piled onto the Dido. Instead, they piled onto a modified town class called the Crown Colony. Yeah, that shows you what the Royal Navy was having an issue with with the Dido. Dido were fine as pure air defence ships, but they really didn't want to build just pure air defence ships. They weren't really considered good as cruisers. If they were going to build an air defence ship and get them rapidly in service, you might as well use the C-class, you might as well use the D-class, you might as well use these World War One legacy vessels, which are actually... When you take off some of the heavy armaments and you rearrange them, pretty good sea-keeping vessels, very stable platforms, everything you want, and then you can chuck a load of air defence. Cunningham wants bigger cruisers. Yes, Cunningham does want bigger cruisers. He wants the town class, and that causes a lot of trouble for a lot of people because the whole purpose of the town class was they were supposed to be sitting in the Pacific scaring the bejesus out of the Japanese because, let's be honest, the town class were surface raiders. Um, we might not call them that, and I'm sure I will have to do a live as well as the various videos I've done on it, but these ships, the town class, were surface raiders. They were billed as counter-surface raiders, but guess what? The same attributes you need to take down a surface raider are the exact ones you need to be a surface raider yourself, and that's what they did. And that's what they were in the... that's why they were deployed to the Far East. You do not need to deploy, if you're Britain, your counter-surface raiders to the Far East for counter-surface raiding. The idea, you might have them around India, you might have them in the Indian Ocean, but you don't need them in the Pacific, in the China Squadron. You don't need them all the way over there, because they're not needed that way if you're just going for surface raiding. You only need them in the China Squadron if you're basically telling the major power in that region, the Japanese, that if you go to war with us, We'll kill your trade. Which they did. 
on regular occasions. That was basically how they kept peace in the 1920s and 30s. People often ask me, what is conventional deterrence like? I go, basically, it's an armed robbery where you don't steal anything, but you point out you could steal it. It's not nice. It's basically being a bully. But it's being a bully in a very subtle, polite fashion. So, C-Class are these wonderful ships during World War Two yeah, for what they were doing. But in World War One, not so great. Would weapon battle class be true to sense of the air Uh No. Yeah, well, weapons, maybe. Um, the battle and daring class, really at a certain point, you get a fusing of these smaller these smaller cruisers with the larger destroyers. And what are they doing? I'd say, actually, the weapon battle and daring class, definitely the battles and darings, what I'm arguing in my book, are tribals growing up. Uh, yes, speak softly, carry a big stick, and make sure everyone can see the stick. So, the basically, the tribals grow up. But, in a way, it's also... The C-Class and the adaptations are a realisation that Henderson isn't going to get as many tribals as he wants. He isn't going to be able to build the super large L-Class and J-Class that he wants. He's got to win the argument. And unfortunately for him, the argument is won after he dies. And that's probably one of the reasons why it takes till 1942 for the battle class to be ordered. Because if Henderson had been alive, even if he'd been the flag officer in charge of the Mediterranean fleet, which had been what his next role would have been after Third Sea Lord, you can guarantee some successes to the tribals would have been built. And it wouldn't have been tribal class being built for Australia and Canada as a sort of agreement for corvettes and that sort of thing. It would have been, right then, we need more of these ships because we need to fill this role. Because you need ships which are more powerful than your regular destroyers to act as your carrier guards, to act as your scouts, to act as this. But you don't want to keep... You, you, can't, you know, keep using light cruisers cut down, because honestly, the light cruisers cut down are very big targets. The example I give when I'm talking about this is that the light cruisers like this are often operating with the tribal class. They're often put with them. Uh, when Admiral, the later to be Admiral Vian, but when Captain Philip Vian leaves his convoy he's escorting off the coast of Africa, and races out to help the forces intercepting the Bismarck, even though he's not been ordered to. He leaves behind the C-class cruiser, which is with them. And he actually says, and it's a sorry message to the captain, but basically says, you can't keep up with me. And if we get in a fight, on a surface fight, you are snookered. Because you don't have the manoeuvrability or the torpedoes to do what I do. And... So the C class stays with the uh, with the convoy. So if they come under air attack, she'd have been great. She'd have provided them a lot of support. Middle East solo, maybe not that much support, but she'd have done some good air defence. But it was off the coast of Africa, and that convoy did manage to make it to Gibraltar. And in Gibraltar, it picked up some more escorts, which were reassigned to it. And a <clears throat> very, very annoyed Admiral Somerville at some point sends a note to Vian going, could you in future keep with your uh, with your convoys? Uh, I, I, I don't want to keep losing destroyers every time you decide you're going to drop one. He gets the destroyers back, you know. They, they return to him eventually. <laughs> Sorry. Just imagining a modern admiral's real face with that, with that going on. Anyway, so the C class, what do they get up to? Well, they get pretty much everywhere, and that's one of the interesting things. There's, they go all over the place, and most of them survive to 1946 to 1948, and they're not sort of the service. They live, they are used, they are very vital parts of the Royal Navy. These are ships which were built in 1917, 1918. Some of them 1916 they started construction in. And yet they are still being riding a crucial part of the Royal Navy in World War II. And they're not like the capital ships. They're not like the battleships, which in World War I were big, powerful ships and then were 
pretty much completely rebuilt in the interwar years. Well, the ones which were very useful anyway, were completely rebuilt in the interwar years so that they would then fight in World War II. These ships had, in many ways, had a pre-war rapid conversion from what was a ship which, frankly, was scaring the bejesus and was just marching on paper. It was there to try and help the Royal Navy make the case to protect all of this. I'm sorry, if you're asking a Navy to secure the entire world and you're going, you know what, I don't think you need a lot of ships for this. You are either a very, very, very bad comedian who's trying to make a joke, or you're a politician who hasn't looked at a map recently. Either one will work. So, the C-Class had kept numbers up. They provided something for the Royal Navy was arguing for replacement. I think they were planning on replacing them with a modified Dido um, design. I think that's what they were uh, planning on if there hadn't been war. Uh, there are talks at one point of a Dido hull with... I think it's four six four double six inch turrets. Yes, Ramsey McDonald. I was going to be nice and not name the poor boy. He certainly tries. Um, but that never happens. What happens is the Royal Navy starts churning out town class and the colony class, uh, crown colonies. Because firstly, what they're doing is they build the town class up and they go, right then, let's build this design as big as we can. It's called HMS Belfast and HMS Edinburgh. Yay! They are our squadron flagships. <sighs> they're all great. The trouble is, now we need to start churning these things out as quickly as possible for war. Okay, let's take it down. Now, every, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> hack system and fire control. Everyone was having similar issues with fire control. It, no fire control system at the beginning of World War II, and not even actually any of them by the end of World War II, were perfect. All of them had issues. The famed American Mark 37, um, DCT-37, was absolutely terrible once you were close. It was very good at long range. It was far, de very decent at medium range. At close range, it was as if... He has, uh, da, 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 da. Um, the Royal Navy's HACS fire control system, remember, is designed based on the best information the Royal Navy has. The thing that underpins it is the concept that your biggest threat, your most likely attacking enemy, is going to be high-level bombers coming in and doing a level bombing attack. So you design your fire control system around making sure your guns have the best targeting profile for that likely attack. Then World War II happens. And the Royal Navy, which is the service which has been arguing for the development and has actually developed a dive bomber, is suddenly proved to have been right. That as useful and as powerful as strategic bombing is, it isn't a war-winning tool alone. It is... A very useful tool, but isn't a war-winning tool alone. And for more about that air power and all those things, please go see Victoria Taylor. She's amazing. Spitfire, at Spitfire filling on, uh, Philly on Twitter. She does videos occasionally. Um, but she's very, very good at her tweets and lots of interesting stuff there. But it isn't what is also being done. There's also the fact of using aircraft as long-range artillery. And when you're using aircraft as long-range artillery, you want to make them as accurate as possible. And that is where the dive bomber comes in. And that is where, actually, these come in. So, if we look at this, uh, what's happened on HMS Kuriko here, you'll notice the four inches there and there. So she has three double four-inch mounts. Now, what she has here and back here, and several along here, are lighter, 40 millimeter, or other kind of amounts, pom-poms, these weapon systems. And the reason they are is they then provide a combined firepower. 
What's interesting is the Royal Navy is in many ways more prepared than other navies because whilst it had developed the hacks and the hacks have been developed had begun its development in a period based on that faulty premise, the Royal Navy by about 1936, 37 is going, this isn't right. We are watching what's happening in Spain. We're watching what's happening in China with Manchuria. We're watching what's happening in other places in the world. Um, yeah, there's going to be dive bombing in our future. We need to make sure we're protected against it. And remember, this is pre-radar being well known about. And I would just like to restate again, and I will state this as many times as possible, because <clears throat> someone very important in my field keeps putting this out, and I'm not going to name names, but it annoys a lot of me. Radio direction finding and radar are not the same things, and radio direction finding is not an early vo a version or an early cover name for radar. It isn't. RDF is where you use, you track down the enemy by their signals, by finding out where they're transmitting. That is what radio direction finding is. Radar is when you're beeping out something and you're getting something back. Okay? They are different. Anyway, so. Everyone was having, was having similar problems and everyone was developing it their own way. The Royal Navy ends up going like most navies do, with this sort of enveloping pattern of lighter guns and medium guns to provide firepower. But remember, it starts war in 1939. The Americans have an advantage, because they then get to watch for a couple of years and get to see what's happening and get to work their industry up. And then when they end up in war, uh, they have managed to move their command and control systems forward that much better under peacetime conditions. So whereas the Royal Navy has had a rapid acceleration in wartime, the Americans have had a rapid acceleration in peacetime. With the, the ease that peace gives you in terms of those things. But also when you have the clear and present danger of war, so you have masses of purse strings without the operational commitments. It makes life for developing weapons for war so much easier when that's the circumstance. Now, what they do and what happens is that by the end of World War II, you have the British importing the American Type Mark 37 DCT. And that's a very good combined control system. It goes on the battle class. It destroys. It goes on HMS Vanguard. It goes on aircraft carriers. It's useful. And it's a very good system for combined control, for being able to feed information to lighter weapons as well as the medium weapons, which are the principal air defence weapon at this time. That's all well and good, but the Royal Navy is actually looking at the next generation. The Americans don't really seem to realise this. Well, probably they do, because they're looking at the next generation as well. But they don't realise the reason the British are buying from them is because it managed to allow them to free up resources to build their own next generation systems. And they are building them. So what I would say is that the hacks comes in for a lot of flack. And it is not always the best system. In fact, in certain systems, it's an absolute downright problem. And... I know points where gun captains have completely ignored the information they've been given, given by hacks and put the gun under manual control and started blasting away manually. I've seen all those sort of stories and I've read all that history. But I would not say it's as wor the worst of anything. And I would say it provides the basis and the methodological basis for a lot of what Britain comes, uh, comes next. And if you're looking at the way we still, to this day, operate when it comes to an air defence scenario. Especially if the exercises I've seen in my life are anything to go by and well, uh, the Falklands War experience. The legacy of hacks, of target identification, of making sure you know what you're shooting at and designing your shooting to best shoot down that profile, of treating every target not just as a group of targets, but as an individual. And being able to differentiate 
in certain ways. I would say its legacy is still going has actually been a strength for British air defence at sea. Any other questions coming on the hacks? Because I'm sorry, I did realise that was a bit of a hobby horse. Now, getting back to the C-Class, because I did say this was a primary about them, and they are pretty darn jazzy. Now, someone mentioned Cairo earlier, and frankly, Cairo is one of the jazziest. I think it was Matthew who mentioned Cairo. There you go. She definitely does look in her dazzle camouflage of various types, very, very jazzy. And what I think you'll find most funny to know is that these, at one point, someone actually tried to standardise these. Yes, someone came up with the bright idea that every single ship we painted in the same pattern. And they had a standardization idea for it. And they were going to try it out first on the C-Class. And it got stopped. Literally it got stopped because it went through all the different levels of government. Right up until it reached someone at the first Sea Lord at the time. Mr. Pound. Who looked at the officer in front of him suggesting this. Apparently cocked an eyebrow and said, have you been drinking? The officer replied, no. And he said, well, I think you should do. Because obviously something's going wrong. <sighs> ah, tachymetric. Yes and no. The hack system was going to be supplemented by a tachymetric system. Uh, TS1 is an idea Ugh. that gets dropped very quickly after the Royal Navy gets a look at the Dutch Hazelmere system. Um, Hazelmere system, uh, sorry. It's called Hazelmere by the British as a colloquialism, but it's actually called the Hesmere system. Um, tachymetric control is very much used for the close in weapons. So eventually the British really get their own working one when the Stag mount goes in. So it's Eventually, the one which is looking best is a system called Buster, which actually never goes into service. It's being developed by the end of World War II uh, because it weighs in at 22 tons, and that's considered way too much for um, <coughs> a light, uh, what's supposed to be a light air defence weapon. Hazelmere weighs 7 tons a unit. Um, Starg weighs in at 14 tonnes, you know, the, these are not light systems by any stretch of imagination. And please note, that's another reason why light cruisers, these cruisers were useful to convert, why the C-Class were so useful. You can stick a lot of top weight on them. You can manage their displacement quite easily so they can carry the top weight. A big problem that the Royal Navy have, especially in World War II, and even to this day, is getting through ships which are big enough to carry the top weight. People always going, oh no, we're building these destroyers are too big, these destroyers are too big, or these frigates are too big, or these cruisers are too big. And you get the director of naval constructors and the third seal all the time sitting there looking at them going, but you want us to put all these systems on them. Whoa, 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 whoa. These systems require space. Uh, and yes, I'm Michael, sorry. Yes. Basically, if it, the most useful anti-ship scenario they could deal with is if they were against perhaps torpedo boats. Perhaps. Um, well, as I'm a lifelong iron brew drinker, so I have no ability to comment on that either. Um, but with the tachymetric systems, a lot was coming in, but they were always supplementary, uh, especially during World War II times and even in pre to that one, because they were still not that reliable. They had a lot of issues in terms of uh, ship movement, ship vibration. I remember one version, the army had a very good system. That they said, oh yes, the Navy can use. 
Navy put on a ship and it stopped working immediately. The reason was the army system, when it's on the ground, when it's turned on, it's stationary and wasn't moving. It stopped. And the ship, of course, is constantly vibrating because of the engines anyway. And it just wouldn't work. Um, Hazemir and Buster were meant to be tracked. They were. Um, Stag is, goes for a simpler arrangement to work. Bus, uh, Hazemir was supposed to be tracked. Stabilised. Didn't really quite work. Points. The Buster is meant to be the best. Unfortunately, again, it weighs so much, it doesn't get used. It really, it, it just doesn't get used. And it gets cut. And their variations of the stag mountings after that. The stag mark three is very, very good. And that you see on the daring class destroyers. Um, the only references you've seen for TS1 described as replaced with the hacks. <sighs> yes. I've seen those references. I've also seen the archive documents and I've looked at the various things in them. And honestly, it's a theoretical replacement for the controlling dual purpose guns. But in reality, it was planned as at least first generation as a supplement to hacks. And it, you would have probably seen ships having a combined system. But how long before a tachyometric system? I would have reckoned if they'd had peace, then by the time you got to about 1943, when TS2 would have been available, uh, that would have been it. As it was, they pushed TS1 as fast as they could in wartime, and they didn't go with it, because it just wasn't producing the results. Yeah. The usual conversations about Royal Navy officers and drunk. They are often in this period. In fact, let's be honest, throughout history, some of the Royal Navy have been drunk. But, um, you know, these days they are very well behaved. I'm sure. I'm sure there are lots of Royal Navy officers who are currently watching YouTube. And I will be saying they are very well behaved and they are never, ever drunk. And I'm not uh, thinking about a Trafalgar night dinner I have been to, or a Toronto night dinner, or any of the other big dinners I have been to right now. Anyway, so. But the C-Class are... <laughs> the police lit up. <laughs> yeah. The C-Class are... They're cute. They work very, very well. Um, one of the things I find interesting about the Royal Navy is when we're talking about World War II, we often forget how many old ships they had in their cruiser force, how big a cruiser force they had. Were the C-Class successful during the East Coast Convoys? Yes, they were. You know, the East Coast Convoys were actually some of their better places. They were pretty. Ca they were very capable air defence vessels. They were very capable at providing the fire support for the air defence, and they did it. Now, as things went on, you find that not just the C class is converted. You have the D class converted, and here is HMS Delhi showing off how quite they convertible. Now, as you notice, her guns are all in turrets and are quite big. Because by the time they're converting D-Class, they have realised that, yes, it's lovely to have the air defence provided by the 40 millimetres, but if you can have the radar and if you can have the longer range bombardment, the longer range flak screen as far away, it does a lot. Will I do a stream on the Falklands Conflict Guards roll on it? Yes, I will. Um, for those who don't know, I am, Falklands War is my other area of history I do. I've organised a conference on it with my girlfriend, because um, she is absolutely specialist in the Falklands War. That's her PhD topic. Uh, me, it was my dis one of my dissertation topics. It was my master's topic. I'm good friends, thankfully, with Michael Clapp and Julian Thompson, who I interviewed for my bachelor's dissertation. They are amazing guys, and I have spent a lot of time looking at Falklands. In fact, just put in funding application for some more research on Falklands War. So I will do a stream on the Falklands War. But 
getting back to the sea class. So these ships were useful. They were very well evolved by the time you get into World War II. And that's another reason why they're kept around. You know, the Royal Navy in World War II is hurting a lot of the time. It is, especially up to 1942, new ships aren't coming online fast enough. It is losing a lot of ships. And there is no surprise to me that when I was looking up the C-Class and I was concerning the dates they were sunk in World War II, it's 1940 for one, 1941 for another, and then 1942 for the three more. Vast majority of the Royal Navy's losses are 1942 and below. Thank you for subscribing, Stefano. In fact, more subscriptions, better. I, I do like having a lot of you there, mainly because it gives me more questions and it gives me more ideas for topics. And I there will be a tweet after this on my Twitter, which will go, what topics do you want to make? Because I've already had four suggestions. Well, two suggestions and two of my own ideas. Um, that I've put together, but the you know there's four more there, four more options openings up in May, so suggestions will be gratefully received. But getting back to the C class, I'm not surprised they get sunk in the earlier part of the war. I'm not surprised that's when they are most exposed. I'm not surprised that's when they are in most uh, issue. But that's also kind of interesting thing because these ships continue to being used. Remember, there are 13 in service at the beginning of World War II. Five get sunk in World War II. That means that eight of them served the whole way through World War II. They served the whole way through the war on the front line. These are ships which are 1916, 1917, 1918, they have managed to be serving the whole way through Second World War, 25, 30 years later, and they're on the front line for all of it. And they're there because they're converted and they're there because they're made useful. And the thing is, they're big enough to be converted. So why am I making a big thing? And why was I really attracted to the idea of C-Class? Well, here's my point. And this is something which perhaps modern navies need to think about more. In the 1930s, the easiest thing for the Royal Navy to have done, if it had had the budget, would have been to cut the sea class and build new. It would have made sense. They could have made the case, these are old, these ships are terrible, da 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 da, da. But that would have taken time. That would have taken money. And it would have taken a lot of effort and it would have taken a lot of things to work out new streams of people coming in, training, retraining crews. You had existing pipelines for these ships. You had existing institutional memory for these ships. These ships had their own characters, their own cultures. They were already in service and they already had experience. They were therefore already known quantities. Therefore, the Royal Navy takes the chance on converting them. Yes, Third Sea Lord, a First Sea Lord, push it through. Yes, there's a director of naval construction called Stanley Goodall, who frankly is the most meticulous, obsessive naval architect you will ever meet in your entire life. I have just written a section of him for my book. He is the naval architect's architect, but he is also very much a sp specialist. And in sort of a perfectionist in terms of the ships. And they work and they're adapted. So perhaps, and this might be coming up with modern navies, perhaps when we're talking about growing fleets and we're growing forces, perhaps instead of us looking at ships and going, oh, we should get rid of these, perhaps we should start thinking about, well, can we convert them? Can we adapt them? What can they be used for? Now, again, yes, arrowhead are far better for the Type 31. <laughs> uh, Liga, have you been reading my PA, uh, my book, <laughs> Conclusion, by any chance? Um, the D-Class were... Uh, the D-Class were very useful by the end of World War II. They had a little bit more trouble in the middle of the conversion, but they were very useful by the end of it. 
Um, and if we can have, not to bang on about Kairat. Yes, there was the incident during Operation Harpoon where the Italian cruisers entered the convoy. There is also a, another convoy action I can talk about where an Italian battleship runs into a um, tribal class destroyer and gets scared off. The thing is, the cruisers that the Italian were being held away, they perceived that the Cairo still had her torpedoes, that she still had the weapons there that the Royal Navy associated with Royal Navy cruisers. The fact that she was not, but she keeps firing a four-inch ammo. And it helps them. It helps because it makes them think, no, you're not interrupting that if you don't worry. Anyway, so it helps because they have the firepower. And remember also, it's going to sound strange. That incident with Cairo is taking her right back to the beginning of the C class because the C class, as light armored cruisers, were supposed to be these ships going in with the destroyer line. And one of the ideas for the reasons they had the six inch guns mounted on the aft rather than the fore was because they would be covering the withdrawal of the destroyers. They turn around with the destroyers and their six inch guns would blaze away to stop the enemy coming in and taking out the destroyers as they withdrew after their torpedo attack. So Cairo going in and supporting the destroyers is very well, you know, supported. It's, it's a traditional thing. It's a good thing. But what it does do, and it, you see, you have this combination. You have the DD's torpedoes. You have the idea that Cairo might be carrying torpedoes. You have all these guns blazing away. The Italians withdraw. And the reason the Italians withdraw in that incident is literally because their own rules of engagement. And the whole time, Axis forces are hampered by their government's willing, unwillingness to lose. They really don't want to have losses of ships. They really don't want to lose these things. So they keep, you know, coming up with the rules of, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, and you, you, you can only attack if you are definitely going to win and all these things. And that's the big loss and for them. I actually have to say that the biggest factor, in my opinion, and I'm this couldn't get me into trouble, but I'm going to say it, in the Royal Navy's winning, winning as much as it did in World War II and securing as much as it did in World War II, and to an extent the US Navy's as well, was their willingness to accept losses. The Royal Navy and the US Navy were willing to accept losses if they had to. They didn't want to lose ships. No ship was expendable. No ship was able, was sent out to be sacrificed. Possibly HMS Camperdown. But no ship was sent out purposely to be sacrificed. But they were willing to accept losses. And they knew they would have losses in operations. But they did them anyway. The Reichsmarine, the Regia Marina... These navies, they are constantly dealing with political leadership which doesn't want to have any losses. And if they do have any losses, then they have big fallouts at home. And that hampers them. That ties one arm behind their back because it stops them being able to be aggressive. It stops them being able to do the things they want to do. You know, in the nicest way, there is always the story of one of the admirals, the Italian admirals, told Cunningham that he sleeps, slept with a copy of a book about Nelson by his bedside. And every night. And Nelson, and Cunningham just laughed. And of course, there's the phrase that, of course, Cunningham didn't need to because Cunningham was the embodiment of Nelson. Well, that wasn't true. But it also was the case that they didn't need... They didn't need they had the idea of being Nelson. Cunningham had the opportunity to be Nelson. In that Nelson had enough political freedom to do what he needed to do when he needed to do it. They didn't. And so that's why Cunningham could win the battles. Anyway, that's me started to ramble. And it's almost an hour. So I'm going to hope that's answered all your questions. I'm going to hope uh, if you have any more, please do tweet at me. And... Please do look out for the tweet, which should have come out at 7 o'clock, which is about May's stuff. And I hope that you will join for more of these discussions in April. 
Take care, and I hope that answers your questions. And I'm going to leave you with Cocoa Boat, HMS Caracol, and a C-Class vessel, which started this discussion off. Take care, and have a nice day.